the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. I'd like to talk to you, talk with you, about our current economic situation, about the financial crisis that we all experienced in 2007, intensely in 2008, and continuing into 2009. And I'd like to structure my uh, initial remarks around three questions for you. The first is, is the crisis really over? And there my answer is going to be no. It's not over. The, the panic phase of, of late 2008 is over, but uh, the consequences of the crisis, dimensions of this crisis, uh, re remain with us uh, and will stay with us for some considerable time to come. And I'll, I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit. The second question is, well, if the crisis isn't over, did we fix the problems that led us to the crisis? Yeah, and my answer on that one is also, is also going to be no. There seem to be some people in the front who know the answers here. Um, it, it, no, we, we didn't fix the problems. We, we didn't actually even have a serious national conversation about the underlying problems, I'm going to argue. And in fact, in my assessment, in the assessment that we put forward in our book, we collectively, and our government on our behalf, through its actions during that intense panic phase, 2008, early 2009, actually made the underlying problems worse because it reinforced the power of our biggest financial institutions, the big banks, the banks that are now called uh, too big to fail. And I'll expand on, on, on whether that's, what that means exactly, uh, and why that is a good term to use. The too big to fail banks are here to stay. Which then suggests, of course, the third question, which is, the crisis is not over, we didn't fix the problem, is this the worst we have to fear? in terms of the financial sector and, and the damage that it could bring us. And, and this, this, point was, this point was made to me, actually, by, by a, a leading banker recently. I, I, talk, I talk a lot to bankers. Well, usually just once. They don't, they don't want to talk to me uh, a second time. And, and this, this gentleman has a very distinguished career at, at uh, many of the, of, the, of the banks that I'm going to be discussing this evening, although right now he works with, with, with on these on the board of directors of a different bank. And he said to me, Simon, you know, you and your friends took a sensible position in, in the Dodd-Frank reform debate around too big to fail, but let's face it, you lost. Get over it, this is just part of the landscape. And, and, and with all due respect to, to, to this gentleman and to, to other people in the financial sector who expressed something similar, I, I really strongly disagree because too big to fail is not the end of the story, or the worst of our problems. There's something that comes after too big to fail. There's a direction, a place, where too big to fail financial institutions lead you. And that is too big to save. That is when the financial institutions, the banks, get so big that when they blow themselves up, you want to save them because of the damage that they, that they will cause. You know they will cause. They are causing before your eyes, but you can't afford to save them because they've become too big relative to your economy. 
Now, this is not a hypothetical case. Let me go back to the, to the first question. Is the crisis over? And, and let me I'll talk about the United States, but let me also talk about the rest of the world, particularly Europe. And in Europe right now, there are several countries grappling with the consequences of banks that became too big to save. And, and this includes, for example, Ireland. Now, in Ireland, for a long while, people thought they had a relatively good fiscal policy. It looked, they looked at the budget deficit. People like the IMF looked at the budget deficit and said, this looks fine. Ireland was even considered by some to be a paragon of fiscal responsibility. But in Ireland, three banks became big. Three banks together had a balance sheet, the right way to think about bank size in this context. They had a balance sheet two times Irish GDP. Three banks twice the size of the Irish economy. We can talk as, as, or as long as you like about how the Irish did this and why they thought it was a good idea, but they did it. And the banks blew themselves up. The banks collapsed. They were saved in the first instance by the Irish government in the fall of 2008. But it turns out that the damage done by these banks is so extensive, has proved so extensive, the Irish government can't shoulder this burden by itself and has been forced to accept financial assistance from the European Union and from the International Monetary Fund. The banks, and this, this, is, this is my bottom line tonight. This is what I really want to get across to you. Very big banks tend to become bigger. We'll talk about the incentives and, 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 and the belief system that leads them to do this in a moment. Very big banks become bigger. Eventually, they can become so big that when they fail, they'll ruin your economy and destroy your fiscal balance sheet. They'll destroy your solvency as a nation. Now, we've already, we, we're facing some f foreshadowing of this in the United States. If you want to... It, if I want to communicate with you that the crisis remains with us, of course, I can talk about unemployment, which, which remains horribly high. This is one of the slowest, most painful recoveries ever seen in the United States. In fact, this recovery doesn't look like anything else we've experienced in the post-war period, post-1945. It's much closer to a mini depression of the 19th century than anything else we've seen in the last 50 to 60 years. Unemployment went down and stayed down. We lost 6% of jobs, and we're still down 5% from our pre-crisis employment levels. This is a very big deal to millions of people. So we could talk about unemployment. We could talk about foreclosures. We could talk about damage done to the housing market. We could talk about damage done to communities. We can also talk about, and those things are very important and very profound in many parts of the country. We can also talk about fiscal damage. We can talk about the damage done to state and local finance, which I think in California you're very well aware of. The consequences of having banks fail, even when you're able to save them, which is what we did, make no mistake about it, we saved these banks from the brink of collapse. Even when you save them, it's very expensive in terms of the overall damage at the federal level and at the state and local level, because of, mostly because of the recession, that the collapse and near collapse of these banks brought. And dealing with those problems is going to take a long time. I doubt we'll have unemployment back to an acceptable level within two years, and I doubt that we'll restore the fiscal balance sheets of these different levels of government to a reasonable level within three or even four years. So how did this happen? How did we find ourselves in such a serious crisis with so much damage, and yet, in my view, not fix the underlying problem? Well, what exactly is the problem? What exactly went wrong? And I think on this, to be honest, there are two versions. There's one version that you hear consistently from 
the Treasury Secretary, for example, Mr. Timothy Geithner. And he argues that the United States encountered what sometimes called some sort of perfect storm. It was a huge storm, and these things are very rare. It doesn't happen more than once every 50 years. Actually, sometimes he says once every 100 years, and sometimes he says once every 10 years, which is kind of a big difference. But anyway, uh, don't overreact, is Mr. Geithner's point, because if you overreact to a 50-year storm, for example, by overregulating, you will regret it between years 1 and 49. Well, that's one, that's one interpretation. Something very specific went wrong around mortgages, around the incentives within the financial system to amplify risks in that market and make them big enough to damage the entire financial system. The other explanation, the explanation that we put forward in our book, is that while there was a big storm, to be sure, emanating in part from the from US residential mortgages. The main problem is that we weakened the levies. So the big storm came. We used to have a lot of restrictions on the kinds of risks that banks and other financial institutions could take on in the United States. Not all of those restrictions were sensible or still functional by the 1980s. But in any case, we abandoned them all. There was a wholesale process of financial liberalization or deregulation started in the 1970s, picked up pace in the 1980s, and really took off in the 1990s. And that process of deregulation greatly weakened the levies, the levies that protect you against these big financial storms. And those levies have not been repaired. Now, why did we do it? Why did we, and, and, and the book goes through this in, in, in detail. I should say that um, we've been very lucky with the book. That it was well received by, 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 by many people, and, and it got very nice reviews. I have no complaint at all about the way it was treated by, by anybody in the media. But my favorite review was the one that appeared in Business Week, where the reviewer said that he liked the beginning of the book. That's the history. We talk about the history of the American financial system and how there have been repeated confrontations between concentrated financial power and elected representatives. And he said he liked, the, he liked the history. He liked the end of the book where we make our policy prescription. We talk about the need to break up big banks, make them smaller as part of a set of policies that will make the system safer. But he said this, all the material in the middle about how Wall Street took over Washington and vastly distorted policy in the favor, that's so obvious. Everybody knows that. <laughs> and the reason I like that review is I thought, well, if it was really true, um, yeah, uh, mission accomplished. Um, but unfortunately, it's not that true, and it's not that well known. So let me give you the short version. If you want the longer version with the footnotes and the documentation, I, I, refer, you, I refer you to the book. The, the key point to, to, to understand, I think, is the ideology of finance. Now, the, the rise of Wall Street, the, the rise to power of these very big banks is, of course, partly about the money. They make campaign contributions. They hire very good people. They, those people go back into government. There's a so-called revolving door between Wall Street and Washington. All, all, all that is true, and we, we can expand on that as much as you like. But what's really distinctive about this sector, and, and even where I would focus my attention on, on these relatively few banks, the largest, now the largest banks in, in our economy, it, it, the, really, the real edge they have, and the reason they get whatever they want, is ideology. It's a belief system. They convinced themselves, perhaps, certainly many other people, including in politics, including in, in academia, honestly, including throughout the policy world, that finance was good, unregulated finance was better, and completely unfettered big financial institutions were the best. It's, it's a fascinating idea. It's, it's a wonderful theory. Of course, it turns out not to be true in practice, and yet we still haven't 
Uh, it, that, that, it does seem that some people also understand that at this point ar around the country, but we still haven't fixed it. These banks, because they persuaded so many people, were able to push for a reduction in any kind of constraint on what they were allowed to do. And as I said, in the, this really picked up pace during the Reagan revolution in the 1980s. But remember, in the 1980s, the Democrats controlled Congress. And actually, the amount of legislation that could get through with regard to financial liberalization and deregulation was relatively small. The big change came in the 1990s, particularly after 1994, when what, what I would refer to as the Wall Street wing of the Democratic Party came to power in Washington. Mr. Robert Rubin became Secretary of the Treasury. Mr. Larry Summers became Deputy, Deputy Secretary under President Clinton. And there was a convergence in views between Mr. Rubin, Mr. Summers, Mr. Greenspan, who was head of the Federal Reserve, Mr. Levitt, who was head of the SEC, and both Democrats and Republicans in Congress, and all the remaining constraints on what banks could do were, were, were removed from legislation. This, this was an extraordinary, extraordinary triumph. And, and what it created was a set of financial firms that cannot fail, that cannot be allowed to fail as long as the government has an ability to do something about it. And to try and, try and make this, uh, this clear to you, let me ask you the following question. Who in the room thinks that today, in this economy, Goldman Sachs could fail? Let's say that Goldman Sachs hits a rock, a hypothetical rock. I'm not saying they have and I'm not saying they will, but let's say they hit a rock today who thinks they could fail tomorrow or this week, go bankrupt, collapse like Lehman Brothers collapsed in September 2008, completely unimpeded by any kind of government bailout? Does anybody in the room think Goldman's, Goldman Sachs can actually collapse, would be allowed to collapse? That's wishful thinking in the front row. I've given, I've given this, I've, given this uh, I've talked about the book 75 or 77 times around the country in, in, the, in, the past, uh, in the past year. Nobody has ever raised their hand except this gentleman here. Uh, <laughs> except one time in New York, and, and that turned out to be two, two guys who were, had big short positions in Goldman stock. So that, that's New York for you. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk later about your positions. S seriously, it can't happen. You, you wouldn't, if you were in the White House or advising the Secretary of the Treasury, you would not be in favor of Goldman Sachs going bankrupt. I would not be in favor of Goldman Sachs failing in this situation. The recovery is precarious. Unemployment is still too high. You don't know, nobody knows, what the consequences would be of Goldman Sachs failing. The largest financial institution that we let fail without any kind of bailout in the last couple of years in the United States was CIT Group. CIT Group was a specialized lender to small and medium-sized businesses. It had a balance sheet of about $80 billion, eight zero. This was in 2009. They said they needed a bailout. They said that credit to their customers would be very disrupted if they didn't get a bailout. And for various interesting reasons, they were turned down by the government. Nobody can show you any consequences of that failure for the broader credit system or even for small and medium-sized businesses. And I have talked to the academics, I've talked to the leading practitioners who work on this issue. That was CIT Group. Now Goldman Sachs has a balance sheet that fluctuates around 800 to 900 billion dollars. It was actually a 1.1 trillion dollar company at the moment when it almost failed in September 2008. Goldman Sachs, in my opinion, would have failed were it not for the fact that it was allowed to convert into becoming a bank holding company, which means that it has unfettered access to the Federal Reserve and can borrow freely. 
So Goldman Sachs, 800 billion. CIT Group, 80 billion. And Goldman Sachs, of course, is not our largest financial institutions. Citigroup, when it failed, I'm sorry, ran out of liquidity. I always get those two things confused. <laughs> Uh, when it failed in, in the fall of 2008, it was a $2.5 trillion company, its balance sheet. We, we can't deal with the failure of, the, of, these, of these mega institutions. Jamie Dimon, who's the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, wrote in an op-ed in the Washington Post in November 2009, we must end too big to fail. This is Jamie Dimon. We cannot end too big to fail unless we have a resolution authority for bank holding companies like JP Morgan, Citigroup. Resolution authority means that you can manage an orderly winding down of the company. The FDIC already has these powers for banks that have retail deposits where you have your savings. But the extent of legal power over bank holding companies previously was somewhat ambiguous. So Diamond said we need a resolution authority, and the Dodd-Frank financial reform legislation contained such an authority. But there's a loophole, a big loophole. It doesn't apply to J.P. Morgan Chase, <laughs> or Citigroup, or Goldman Sachs, or Morgan Stanley four of our largest six bank holding companies. Because those banks are inherently global. Citigroup, at its peak, employed nearly 400,000 people working in over 100 countries. It's still over 300,000. Goldman Sachs brags about doing business in more than 90 dialects. Lehman Brothers, when it failed in New York, when it went bankrupt, declared bankruptcy on a Sunday, defaulted on over 600,000 open derivatives contracts in London. You see, in order to handle the failure of a big global bank in any fashion other than the Lehman fashion, which, as I think you all remember, was a calamity and a disaster and caused cascading failures across our financial system and around the world, to do anything else, you would need a cross-border resolution authority. You would need a prior agreement between all the governments involved regarding who gets what kind of assets in the event of failure. Now, perhaps one day we will have such a cross-border agreement. We don't have it now, and we're not going to get it. And if you don't believe me, you can go talk to the G20 deputies, like I have done, about this issue. Well, probably you can't, but you probably have friends who can. It's not going to happen. Now, maybe, the, maybe this is a mistake. Maybe other governments in the world are, are seriously deluded in not agreeing to such an authority. We can have that discussion. But let me tell you, as a matter of fact, the cross-border resolution authority will not exist. Therefore, you cannot have the orderly liquidation of a bank like J.P. Morgan Chase. When you put this to senior Obama administration officials in private, they will concede the point and say, well, Simon, that's true, but we can do a conservatorship. A conservatorship means you take over a bank, you guarantee its liabilities, but perhaps you wipe out the shareholders and perhaps you fire the management this time. But the conservatorship protects the credit. No creditors take losses. That's the worst that can happen to somebody who lends money to J.P. Morgan Chase or Citigroup. There's a government guarantee backing those banks. Now, I have many Republican friends Actually, not quite as many as I did when I started out on this, but still have many. And, and, and my Republic, many of my Republican friends like to point out that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had too much political power, too little capital, took on reckless risks, 
and blew themselves up at great cost to the American taxpayer. And to all my Republican friends who make those points, I would say this. You're right. Now, I disagree with people who say that Fannie and Freddie were the central drivers of the last crisis. Again, we can go through the historical record. You can read my book. They were certainly present at the scene. They certainly did themselves plenty of damage. Don't get me wrong. But they were not the primary drivers of what happened and when it happened. Be that as it may, those government-sponsored enterprises had an implicit government guarantee And that, is the heart of, that, that was the heart of their problem. They're now owned by the taxpayer, by the way. It's a different problem. And that is exactly the structure now surrounding our large bank holding companies. Now, people who... There's one senior uh, government official in particular from the, um, of the last two decades... Okay, it's Alan Greenspan, um, <laughs> who will say in some settings, probably not this one, that when he testified to Congress saying that Fannie and Freddie were not backed by the full faith and credit of the US government, he had his fingers crossed. I don't quite understand. I'm an immigrant to the United States. I've been here 25 years. I still don't understand why it's okay to lie with your fingers crossed. Someone explain that to me later. But in any case, Fannie and Freddie could borrow more cheaply because of the government guarantee. It makes sense. In fact, Hank Paulson uh, says in his memoir, I would take a lot of what's in his memoir with a, with a big grain of salt personally, but this, this one I, I believe to be true, that when Fannie and Freddie were in trouble in the summer of 2008, he was called up by the Chinese, by the Chinese government, and they said, Hank, where's our guarantee? They had bought a lot of Fannie and Freddie debt, so-called agency paper, and they wanted the US government to make good on its guarantee. And Hank Paulson says in his memoir that he felt it was necessary to guarantee Fannie and Freddie in part because of that pressure from the people who do own a great deal of our government debt, as well as other assets in the US economy. So Fannie and Freddie got their guarantee. They were able to borrow more cheaply in the run-up to the crisis because of that guarantee. And, and reliable estimates place that funding advantage at at least 25 basis points. So that's 0.25 of a percentage point. How much of a funding advantage do the likes of J.P. Morgan Chase and Citigroup and Goldman Sachs get today because they're too big to fail, because they have the implicit government guarantee? Well, estimates vary, but it's at least 25 basis points. Some people put it at 75 basis points. I would say 0.5 percentage point, 50 basis points as, as my current preferred estimate. These big banks can borrow half a percentage point cheaper because of the government guarantee. Standard & Poor's has modified their credit rating methodology in the light of circ these circumstances and these developments. They now rate a bank on a, on a standalone basis and on a systemic basis, where systemic means how likely you are to be supported by the government and how strong the government balance sheet is that's supporting you. A friend of mine asked a leading banker, European banker, why, this is the CFO of a big bank, why he didn't move, why the bank didn't move headquarters. This is a bank that is domiciled in the UK. It's a, known as a British bank, but it does almost all of its business outside the UK. And it complains, this, the, the, these, the people running this bank complain about various restrictions put on their activities by, by the British authorities. And they say that they, that they keep threatening to move. So my friend said, why don't you just move? Why don't you move to the Cayman Islands or the Bahamas or some other really nice warm place? San Marino is also available. And, and this banker's answer was very interesting. He said, no, we couldn't do that. Those places don't have any balance sheet to back us up. You see, the bankers get this. The bankers understand very well 
that they need the government behind them, that that's the essence of their business model now. This, the points I'm making to you, uh, this, is, this is very important, the points I'm making to you, and, and this view of the financial system, is not a left-wing view. The book, 13 Bankers, stands on the shoulders of a giant, intellectual giant, George Stigler, who was a University of Chicago professor who wrote about regulatory capture in a convincing manner and, 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 and would be shocked by, if he had lived to today to see the extent of it in modern America. George Stigler is not a man of the left. Gene Farmer and John Cochran, two leading finance professors at Chicago, both, generally speaking, in the efficient markets camp with regard to thinking about finance. Both of those people argue that what we're looking at here is not a market. It's a subsidy scheme. It's a distortion. And they're actually in agreement with my friends on the left, Joe Stiglitz, for example, at Columbia, who argue that this is an unacceptable concentration of power and a completely distorted system of incentives that encourages too much debt, too much leverage, debt relative to equity, and reckless risk-taking because the bankers get the upside when things go well, and when there's a downside and the bank's close to collapse, they have a put option so they can put their bad debts one way or another onto the government. So the left and the right agree on this at an intellectual level. And, and I, personally, am not a radical of right or left. I'm the former chief economist at the International Monetary Fund. And they actually have a test at the IMF that screens out radicals of the left or right. <laughs> and, and I did very well on that test. I am merely telling you what the IMF would tell you if, it, if the IMF could speak truth to authority in the United States, which it cannot. The view that I'm giving you is the view from mainstream finance. It's the view from people who look at finance in an informed way with a critical distance, people who don't work for the banks and people who don't take money from the banks. The intellectual right gets this, the intellectual left gets this. The problem is the political right and the political left. Very few people in Washington want to take this on. There was a moment during the Dodd-Frank financial reform debate when an amendment came to the floor of the Senate, the Brown-Kaufman Amendment, sponsored by Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio and Senator Ted Kaufman of Delaware. And this amendment would have limited the size of our largest banks and would have limited their leverage, how much they could borrow relative to their equity. Such restrictions are not a magic bullet, but they would be a helpful complement to many other measures necessary to make our financial system safer. And the good news is that the Brown-Kaufman amendment attracted much more support after a lot of work by, by, by those senators, much more support than you would have thought possible, and actually got 33 votes on the floor of the Senate. The bad news, of course, is that 33 is not a majority in the US Senate. 61 senators voted against it. And, and that opportunity passed. At the height of the crisis in 2008, our biggest banks were on the verge of failing. They were saved by the government. They were saved by you, by the taxpayer. And now they cannot fail. In fact, they were put back on their feet with no strings attached by President Obama in the spring of 2009. That's the third, reference to the 13 bankers. The primary reference is 13 bankers who were pulled into the White House in March 2009. And they were saved, including their jobs, their pensions, their boards of directors, everything about how they see the world and how they operate. 
remained intact. So they almost failed, they were saved, they were put back on their feet, and then the administration said, we'll do financial reform. The problem is, once you put them back on their feet, and they have the money again, they have the bonuses, they have the earnings, they plow that back into lobbying to prevent reform. Eventually, the Treasury Department got this, at least Neil Wolin, who's Deputy Treasury Secretary, gave a, for him, fiery speech to the Chamber of Commerce in early 2010. And he said, you're spending $1.4 million a day. You have four or five lobbyists per member of Congress, all resisting financial reform, and you must stop. And of course, they didn't stop. Why would they stop? The big banks like the system the way it is. It's good for the people who run those banks. It lets them take on that risk. It lets them cash out when times are good. The latest research on that, by the way, there's a very good research paper by two professors referenced on my, on my website, Baseline Scenario, where you can find a lot more up-to-date assessments and documentation of all, all these issues. But this paper shows that during the cycle between 2000 and 2008, the largest 14 financial institutions, the CEOs took out in cash $2.6 billion. Uh, people who were shareholders in those banks, uh, probably some of you in the room here this evening, did not do very well. And the striking thing about the CEOs is they seem to have known when to sell. So for anyone who thinks that what happened was just a huge accident and the CEOs were caught unaware because they were just as uninformed as the stockholders, you have to read this paper and reflect on it. There's an awful lot of good luck that was manifest here, and a lot of stock trades. Uh, in fact, they traded, they sold more than 100, 100 times more stock in their own companies than they bought. And this is true of the biggest financial companies. This is not true of all financial companies. It's not true, for example, of small banks. The people running these big banks like the system the way it is. The, the system, and they love the system after the crisis with this confirmation or affirmation that they're now too big to, too big to fail. They don't want to change that. Why would they? And they prevented serious attempts at reform through the Dodd-Frank financial legislation. Actually, to be honest, it was also the Obama administration. The, Brown Calf the Treasury Department brags to the press about having defeated the Brown-Kaufman Amendment. They said, if we, the Treasury Department, had supported the amendment, it would have passed, but we didn't support it, so it failed. If it were the case that having too big to fail banks is just part of the landscape, something we should get used to, just an, another way we get ripped off from time to time in the American economy, Perhaps we could be comfortable with that, or at least we could agree to ignore it until the next crisis. But that is not the end of our problems. Secretary Geithner gave uh, an extraordinary interview a couple of days ago to Noam Scheiber of the New Republic, and you can read it on the New Republic's website at least this morning. It wasn't behind their paywall. And at the end of this interview, Mr. Geithner says, that he thinks there will be an increase in demand for financial services in emerging markets such as India, China, and Brazil, and he wants American banks to provide those financial services and to expand globally. And he says, I have recognized that this brings with it some risks, but we can regulate effectively to control those risks. This is the Secretary of the Treasury. Now, remember, you can't handle the failure of a global bank. I already told you that. Everything we know about emerging markets, in fact, all our countries, is not that they 
develop and go up forever. It's that they go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. And that's true of their financial sectors too. Boom, bust. And, and we know that regulation doesn't work at the level of preventing very powerful players from taking on big risks. That's what we saw in this crisis. That will, that's what we've seen in repeated crises over the past 30 years to varying degrees in the United States. The, the Bank of England, by the way, gets this. The Bank of England, Mervyn King, the governor of the Bank of England, gives speeches where he talks about the doom loop, with the doom loop meaning a cycle of boom, bust, bailout, create the incentives for another boom, oh my goodness, we just went bust, we have to do another bailout. But it's not just a loop, it's a doom loop because it gets worse as the banks get bigger. The Swiss National Bank gets this. Of course, they need to get it because in 2008, their two largest banks, UBS and Credit Suisse, were together, had a balance sheet of eight times Swiss GDP. UBS was a bank almost destroyed by people trading mortgages for it in London. I haven't had a chance to check, but I'm reliably informed that not very many people, the, not very many people on that mortgage desk were Swiss nationals and they almost broke down UBS. You, you can't back up banks that become that financially global. If you're a small country, it's clear. Iceland, oh my goodness. A country that for a while operated like a hedge fund in the middle of the Atlantic. Three banks, when they failed, had a combined balance sheet between 11 and 13 times the size of the Swiss economy. The Royal Bank of Scotland, RBS, one bank in the United Kingdom, when it failed and was taken over by the UK government at the end of 2008, RBS had a balance sheet one and a half times the size of the British economy. Now, our largest bank in 2008 was Citigroup with a balance sheet of $2.5 trillion. Let's call that a little bit over 15% of US GDP. If Citigroup, next time it fails, and, and by the way, Citigroup has failed three times in the past three decades. It failed in 1982 because of bad loans to emerging markets. It failed at the end of the 1980s because of bad loans to commercial real estate. And it failed at the end of 2008, actually failed a couple of times at the end of 2008 and in early 2009 because of residential, bad bets made around residential mortgages. So next time Citigroup fails, what if it's not a two and a half trillion dollar bank? What if it's a 20 trillion dollar bank? That would make Citigroup in the future the same size relative to the US economy as RBS was relative to the UK economy in 2008. Well, you say, Simon, come on, $20 trillion, that's a long way from where we are. Fine. Let's say we financially globalize, like Mr. Geithner suggests, and like the CEOs of these banks want to do. Jamie Dimon told the New York Times at great length in a profile in the, new, in the magazine in December that he wants to globalize and make JP Morgan into the same kind of powerhouse that Mr. Geithner wants. In fact, Mr. Geithner and Mr. Diamond seem to be drawing from the same talking points. So we do that. So Citigroup, let's say next time is a $5 trillion bank, or J.P. Morgan Chase, Mr. Diamond's bank is a $4 trillion or $5 trillion or $10 trillion bank compared to $2 trillion today. Does the failure of one of those banks at that scale make our problems next time smaller or larger than they are today. It makes them larger. What was the fiscal damage done to the federal government in the United States by this financial crisis, by the reckless behavior of these banks? Well, I'm on the advisory panel of the Congressional Budget Office, and I would like to stress these are my numbers, not their numbers, but their numbers are moving in my direction. If you compare the CBO baseline for our deficit and our debt 
before the crisis and after the crisis. This has changed, this has increased by about 40 percentage points of GDP. Now, to be clear, this is net federal government debt held by the private sector, which I would argue and the CBO would argue is the right measure to look at. 40 percentage point increase, that's roughly a doubling of that measure of debt. That's the fiscal crisis. That's why people begin to become more concerned about deficits, although it is interesting that you do not hear this discussed in Washington as the primary driver of today's current deficits and the projections of big debt in the immediate future. And by the way, this deficit is very little to do with the fiscal stimulus. We can argue about whether that was a good stimulus or a bad stimulus in size and in design. That's a fine discussion. This is not about the stimulus. This is about the recession. This is about the damage done by the banks. Damage done to you and to me and to other American citizens while they were taking out $2.6 billion in cash for the CEOs, just the CEOs. Now, this is not about recrimination. This is not about revenge. This is not about punishing anyone. Again, those are fine topics. We can discuss them. My concern is the future. My concern is next time. If you have the same incentives, or if the incentives got worse, if the incentives are pushing the big banks further towards taking massive risks, you are asking for big trouble. These banks will not just take those risks, they will scale up. This is what they are paid to do. And, and that some of these bankers like Jamie Dimon are very good at this. Global financial stability is nowhere in Mr. Dimon's job description. I haven't seen his job description, but I can say that quite confidently. His job is to make money for the shareholders of J.P. Morgan Chase, and of course, for himself and his co-workers. The best way for him to do that is to get bigger and to borrow a lot of money. And remember, there's a subsidy for borrowing when you're too big to fail. It's a big subsidy. You should leverage up. Borrow more relative to your equity. Now, of course, there is an agreement, a new agreement, on capital in banks, on how much equity they should have. It's called the Basel III Agreement. And it will require that American banks have between, probably end up between 10 and 11% of tier one capital when all is said and done. Lehman Brothers had 11.5% tier one capital the day before it failed. So it is very hard to believe this is enough capital or enough equity. Gene Farmer, who I cited a few minutes ago from the University of Chicago, thinks that our banks, in order to be truly safer, should have at least 40% capital, 4-0. The Swiss National Bank is requiring its two biggest banks to have 19% capital. Leading people in the United Kingdom are pushing hard for capital in excess of 20%. Where are we? Where's the Federal Reserve? Where's the Treasury Department on this? They're nowhere. They refuse to listen. They refuse to listen to the experts on this. They refuse to even engage in serious dialogue with the outside experts. It's extraordinary, but true. So this is how it goes down with the too big to save banks. You're in the Oval Office and somebody tells the president that a global mega bank is about to fail. And you don't know, no one can tell you, the Federal Reserve hasn't figured out the consequences of this bank failing. 
how this is going to cascade across borders, how it's going to impact American national interests. And you're in favor, perhaps, of the bank failing, or perhaps you think it should be supported, but it doesn't matter. There are other people in the room who have the president's ear who say it has to be saved. And those people, for example, might include Bill Daley, who recently became chief of staff to President Obama. Bill Daley was formerly head of corporate social responsibility at J.P. Morgan Chase. It turns out corporate social responsibility to bankers means chief lobbyist. And he says, you have to save the banks, Mr. or Ms. President. But can you afford it? If the losses are so big and the hole in their balance sheet is so damaging, can you rescue them? Mr. Geithner says yes. Mr. Geithner was interviewed by Neil Borowski, who's the Special Inspector General for the TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. And Mr. Geithner said, we have the tools, we can do the rescues in the future. Really? Well, it didn't work in Iceland, didn't work in Ireland. Switzerland came close to calamity. If the banks get big enough, if they become more global relative to your economy, you cannot handle that failure. You can try. You can throw everything you have at it. But then the markets will turn against you. There is nothing in any law of economics or physics or anything else that I'm aware of that says the US dollar must be the reserve currency of the world for all time. We, we caught a break this time because people came to the United States with their money when everything was going bad around the world. And they came, believe it or not, because these many people Many very different people, many of whom may, not, may or may not like what everything the U.S. stands for, but these people believe at the end of the day, we will be fiscally solvent. We will pay our debts. They want to put their money into treasury obligations. And it has to be said, too big to fail banks, because remember, they're backed by the treasury. But if you ruin the fiscal accounts of this country, that won't happen anymore. Again, Ireland was viewed as a fiscally solvent, sound, and responsible country. It blew itself up fiscally because the banks got out of control and caused so much damage that the Irish state could not afford to plug that gap. That's where we're headed. That's the logic of our situation. That's the incentives that our bankers face. And, and that, frankly, is the implication of the policies being pursued, actually trumpeted by Mr. Geithner. I don't know when it will happen. I don't know how long it will take. I don't know if we can find a way before that calamity to take decisive action. But I really hope that we can. Thank you very much. I start with the premise that government serves the powerful and will always do that. And it seems to me that what you're describing is a situation in which Salvation lies in, this, in a powerful government suddenly deciding to resist the impulses of these powerful institutions. Now, it seems to me there's another approach to this, and you suggested it. You said the bankers wouldn't want to do business in the Cayman Islands because they wouldn't get bailed out there. What about taking the other approach? Instead of, trying, instead of having the government try to regulate the banks that contribute all this money to them through the lobbyists, how about not letting the government have the power to bail these guys out and they would not get yeah. into this trouble in the first place. Okay, 
Thank you. Well, it's a good, it is a question from the right. Uh, it's a good question. Um, the, the, pro the problem is, it's, I, and I understand it's very appealing, the problem is one of, of, of what uh, people sometimes call credible commitment, which means I promise I'm not going to bail you out. I swear up and down. I campaign for office. I pass a constitutional amendment saying that I cannot bail you out. But then we come to the White House, we come to the Oval Office, we come to this conversation, and you're the president. And, and, and Bill Daly says to you, or, or the leading financial experts, people you've handpicked, say to you, Mr. President, unless you save this bank, we will have another Great Depression. Right? This is what your experts tell you, your advisors. That's a tough call, right? Are you going to go with unsavory and potentially illegal bailout under this scenario? or? plunge the United States and the world into a Great Depression, and who knows when you come out of that and how you come out of that. And, and remember all the other things that happened, the non-economic things that happened in the 1930s. So just, I, I, I am, I suggest and I urge us to break up the largest banks, to put size caps on, make them smaller, make them small enough to fail. That was my CIT group point. Because the only way if you credibly to commit not to bail them out is make it so they're small enough to save. And it's not just small enough, it's also simple enough, it's enough capital, enough equity. That's where I think we're going to the same place, but don't just say, oh, do whatever you want, I'm just not going to save you, because that won't be credible at the end of the day, I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, I, I do see a problem, uh, like you, you're saying, with trying to get the government to do anything because they seem to be captured. So whatever we want the government to do, a government solution seems almost impossible to get because of the pre-existing capture. So I have a, a quite different question for you, assuming that's the case. Um, if you were aware in the 30s, a national bank or a national bank type of organization was created which bypassed all the banks. It was larger than all of the banks. It was called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and it essentially conducted all of the uh, liquidation, uh, putting banks into receivership, and this is before FDIC was created, and it, it reformed the railroads, it reformed every failing in, uh, sector of the economy, and uh, I believe that wh why could we, if the government, say, for instance, can't do anything right now if it's too blocked, why couldn't we, or smart business people, bankers who have the right sense and the right dedication to the country, form a bank, make it big enough, attract the investment, the deposits, 401k plans, and get to a level where they are bigger than all of the other banks, and begin to put the pressure on them and put the pressure on the government to cut off the umbilical cord of bailouts, and invest, make the investments, which are smart investments that can be made now, uh, that are profitable, just like the RFC did. I'm actually holding the book written by the chairman of the RFC. It talks about exactly how he did all these things and did it and made a profit. The RFC returned a profit to the government uh, in the 40s when they shut down from all their depression era recovery operations. So it's basically stimulus through supplying credit and using the credit that exists that's our money that sometimes is even in these banks. Why don't we withdraw that and put it in and organize it into a national type of bank? Uh, what's the impediments to that uh, politically and uh, legally? Okay. So thank, thank you. It's another uh Good question, also from the left, as it turns out. Uh, <laughs> look, your idea has many appealing aspects, including the critical point that this is your money. Louis Brandeis wrote a fantastic book about the financial system and how it operated in um, 1912 called Other People's Money and How the Bankers Use It. And that is the basis of exactly the power that we're, that we're discussing. And I, for one, I'm delighted when entrepreneurs want to set up new ventures, new banks included, that would take on these kinds of issues as, as you frame them. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at MIT, among other things, and I am not anti-finance. I'm strongly pro-finance, but pro-finance on a sensible basis. However, I do want to caution you about two things. First of all, or at least express my own preferences, I don't want the government to run a bank. I don't think the government's run, good at running a bank. I think a government bank would tend to have the kind of problems that Fannie and Freddie had. I would rather have the government step back completely from any kind of mortgage guarantees. Hold on, there's a big line of people behind you. Don't. Um, and secondly, um, when you said you'd make a bank that was bigger than all the other banks? I didn't say it was a government-run bank. No, fine. It was a bank. Fine. The it, was a private bank. If, 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 if you're talking about making a very big bank of any kind, I get nervous. 
I'm sorry, because it's a question of incentives. If any bank with any kind of ownership structure becomes so big that its failure can damage the economy, we're back to a too big to fail situation. I would rather have lots of little banks, lots of savings banks, lots of credit unions, whatever you prefer, take on the function you're talking about. But it's not happening in part because the big banks have the market power. The big banks offer you attractive services in part because they can do that because they have cheaper funding costs. It all comes back to the government subsidy that locks us into this existing organization of the, mar of the market. In fact, it's not a market. It's a subsidy scheme. It's a total distortion of the market. It's a barrier to entry for entrepreneurs. I, I could have talked more about barriers to entry if I'd known you liked them. Uh, but that, that, so that's, that, that's, that's my, my concern, is that you have to deal with that the political power implicit here. But you're right, that the government can't fix this. How can the government fix it if it's captured? That's the essence of the problem. That's why you need simple rules, you need a change in the thinking around the, the political elite. Otherwise, we're not gonna get out of this. Because we don't have the choice to use other money, I was wondering what you think would happen if we took away all the legal tender laws and took away the privileges of the Federal Reserve and tried to introduce competing currencies so that we would have a choice of which type of money to use, and the government would have to start managing its money well because they would be afraid that people would stop using their money. It's, it's really fascinating that um, in, in many ways we're going back to the debates, the, the big debate uh, that the country had between 19, 1907 and 1913 before the founding of the Federal Reserve. See, there were two camps at, the, at that time. Um, one was led by Nelson Aldrich, powerful senator, central to, to the most prominent business networks of the, countries, of the country. His daughter married John D. Rockefeller's son. Aldrich and his friends wanted a backstop. They wanted, the, they wanted a central bank that would help protect the financial system because we hadn't had one to that point. And in 1907, the financial system almost failed. But they didn't want to go too far and allow inflationary finance and allow democratic politicians to, to run big deficits. They were inflation hawks in, in modern language. On the other hand, you had the Pujo Committee, and, and its findings were articulated by Louis Brandeis in the book I mentioned a short while ago. They didn't want the big banks to have the backing of a central bank because they thought it would lead to reckless risk taking. So there was suspicion from the left and from the right, and that's how we got a Federal Reserve System that has a very strange governance system. And honestly, th this is a tough problem. There's no good answer. There's no one answer. The, gr the Irish have just blown themselves up in the scenario that Peugeot and Brandeis were worried about. The Greeks have blown themselves up through massive deficits and irresponsible politicians in the Aldrich, the scenario Aldrich was worried about. There is no good solution to this, I promise you. It's, many have been tried, including the, the, the Federal Reserve. It, it is... You, you cannot, in particular, operate a monetary system without tough, effective regulation of the financial system, including recognizing the problem of capture. And we've struggled with this for 100 years. We found a way after the 1930s that worked not too badly. It certainly was conducive to growth. It certainly was conducive to a lot of innovation. It certainly was conducive to the kind of prosperity that brought us all here today. But then we lost, took our eye off the ball and we lost track of it. And I, I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't think we should go back on the gold standard. I don't think we should start trading Hungarian forints or whatever parallel currency you have in mind. The Hungarians did this in 1947, by the way. It didn't go very well. Uh, I think we have to stick to our knitting. We have to go back and fix the problems that are, that are broken. It's the heart of the financial system. It's the incentives there. And we've got to do that while recognizing the political system is captured. It is not an easy problem. I actually uh, submit that there is a solution, and uh, it's not my solution, it's the guys who convened in 1787 in Philadelphia. Uh, they put a convention clause in the Constitution, and uh, in the beginning of your talk, you said that we, uh, the American people, were denied a national discussion. And uh, that's what the Article 5 convention is. It's a national discussion, you know. The president invited 13 bankers into the Oval Office. We're, we're, did we get to discuss that? You know, did we, do we get to discuss uh, ideas outside of what uh, Geithner or uh, Paulson are, are discussing? So, um, 
there are more folks today talking about the need for a federal convention, and the arguments against a convention um, are totally invalid and bogus. It can't rewrite the Constitution. It's there for a reason, and so hopefully as we move into the next year, uh, more folks will get a tipping point to say, hey, yeah, let's uh, convene a national convention. We'll have that discussion, and I guarantee you the folks that show up at that convention, they will figure out a way to make sure we don't fail again. Well, it's an, inter it's an interesting idea. I think um, be careful what you wish for is one reaction. And another, and I do like the historical parallels, and I do like going back to thinking about what worked and what was intended early on. I actually, I go back more often to Teddy Roosevelt. In 1901, when Teddy Roosevelt decided to take on the big industrial and railroad, tr uh, and railroad trust in this country, everybody thought he was crazy. The Senate was known as the Millionaire's Club for a reason. The idea that monopoly could be bad was, was very unintuitive to the American mainstream. People like you, sitting in an audience, in an auditorium like this in 1901, would not have had a clue what Roosevelt was on about. And J.P. Morgan, the man, the original J.P. Morgan, came to see Roosevelt at the White House in early, 2000, in early 1902 and said, if we've done anything wrong, send your man to see my man and we'll fix it up. And fortunately, Roosevelt and his attorney general said, no, we don't want to fix it up, we want to stop it. And they took that case to the Supreme Court, and they won five to four. And out of that came not just more antitrust legislation and cases, but also a, a shift in the consensus. So I don't know how we're going to get there. Maybe it's this way. Maybe it's, which is more about leadership. Maybe it's your way, which is more about no, 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 this it's convention. Not, it's not my way. It's, it's the Constitution's way. I didn't write the Constitution. <laughs> I wasn't accusing you of writing the Constitution. <laughs> But I, what I, we need to do is change the consensus. We need to have that discussion. We need to change people's thinking. In 1901, people thought that big business was efficient, it was modern, it was good. By 1911, 10 years later, when the, when the government moved to break up Standard Oil, everybody had figured out that bad, big could also be bad. Big could be damaging. And this wasn't about abolishing big corporations in the United States. It was about constraining certain kinds of power. In that case, market power. In this case, the power that comes with being too big to fail. For the good of society. Does anyone in the room today want to have one company with a 90% market share in petroleum products? No. Uh, again, only one person ever raised his hand saying that he wanted it. It turned out to be a lobbyist in Washington. Uh, of course you don't want it. Nobody wants it. Everybody gets that. It's intuitive. Even high school students understand that. We need to shift our thinking on banking one way or another in that very same direction. I wondered if you took all the economists in the world who are sort of qualified to have an opinion about the things you're talking about, and you uh, uh, took away the ones who are making money from the banks or from the federal government, um, first of all, I wonder how many you'd have left, but of those, <laughs> of those, um, who, who has the principal argument, who disagrees with you? Who has the principal arguments that disagree with you, and what are the, what are the most impressive and principal arguments that uh, disagree with you? I thought you were going to tell a joke at the beginning. Uh, I was. About having, economists having trouble reaching a conclusion. Right. Um, Look, the, um, the people who were in the room in early 2009 say to me, Simon, you don't understand. If we had disturbed a hair on the head of a single Citigroup director, we would have deepened the crisis and worsened the recession. That, that's what they say. And these are smart, accomplished people. I don't think that's true, and that's one reason we wrote the book, was to counter that. And so in the book, we, try to, we do try to take their argument seriously and go through it blow by blow. But even if it is true, if that's their position, that there was no alternative, think about the consequences. Think about the power that that gives these, these big banks. I actually, even people on the other side of the debate will, will say privately, either directly to me or, or, or to my colleagues, that they agree this capture is, was, Huge, complete. But they say the Dodd-Frank legislation has fixed it. Well, it, it can't have fixed it. it. There's nothing in the legislation that, that addresses 
that this, this core issue. On, on bank capital, a core issue now, but in, in terms of live debate, how much capital should banks have? There are plenty of people who, who come out with counter arguments. And, and one of my uh, colleagues, Anat Admati, who's a professor at Stanford, has gone through every single one of those arguments systematically in a 50 page paper, destroying every single one of them. You have to look at her website on the Stanford Graduate School of Business page. I'm trying to be fair, I'm trying to be reasonable, I'm trying to recognize all sides of this debate for you. And if you think we, we, we're not picking up on or responding to reasonable arguments, tell me. You can tell me on my blog. We're open to comments from everyone. I honestly think we've, we've covered the scope here, and, and the counter arguments are either we had no alternative, in which case think about where that leads you, or if you do it, it'll cause bad stuff to happen like you won't get any economic recovery, which is what Anat Admari debunks. So th this is where we are in the debate from my, from my point of view. I don't think this is so much about the analytics and the economics anymore. I think it's all about the politics. It's all about the power. It's all about the money. Could you paint a brief picture of how, it, how the economy might have uh, been if we'd, we'd had a hard crash, um, a lot more job loss, but a lot less national debt, and then a slow recovery based on actual real assets instead of what we did? Yeah, I don't quite, I don't quite see that scenario. So the, the, this is a scenario in which we let the banks collapse? Yes, primarily. Yeah, but the problem with that, see, the, this, is, this, is, this is the heart of the, of, of the issue, which is if you let the bank, so what we, um, what we saw and what we experienced in September, October of 2008, and what I have gone back and looked at, and lots of other people who, who I trust have looked at this in, in, in whole or, or in key parts, that was a global financial meltdown. That was a, a 1929 to 1931 type experience compressed into two months. So any scenario that would, would have followed from allowing that collapse to go ahead without uh, the bailouts we did and without the bailouts the Europeans did, that leads you down to somewhere like 1933, 1934, which is, you know, your output is down 20, 30, 40% from before, and employment would vary across countries, but at least in the United States, we'd have a lot of unemployment, open unemployment, 20% more. And, and, and you don't necessarily get a fast recovery from that. So it's true in post-war recessions, the typical pattern was you go down 1%, 2% of employment and you bounce back fairly quickly. But that's not the case for major financial crises in, in our historical experience or the experience of emerging markets. In those, you tend to go down further and you stay down. So I, I'm not really not attracted to any scenario in which you let the banks, big banks of, 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 the, of the kind that we had in 2008 and the kind we had today, letting them all collapse together and then trying to pick up the pieces, that's a, that's a very long haul and it has global consequences that we, that we can't contemplate. It, I, I, regarding the stock market, by the way, to be clear, the, the really striking contrast is between the recovery in employment, which is almost non-existent, um, follow, following the loss of 6% of jobs, with the recovery in profits. The recovery in profits, not just in the financial sector, but also in the non-financial sector. And, and the problem there is the companies are not hiring. The, big, the CEOs of the big companies are very happy with their lives and, and, and the way everything is going and with the global marketplace, and they're delighted to add jobs in India or China, but not in the United States. And, and, and this, is, this is a deeper problem. It's a, it's a longer standing problem about skills and about education in the United States that we haven't addressed, and we're getting further from addressing it because of the fiscal crisis. As an econ major here at UCSB, I have kind of a troubling question, kind of more on the educational aspect of this. And that's, uh, personally, I, I feel I was lucky enough um, to study this situation when I went abroad. And I took you know, a, a course with a professor who taught me what little I know about the crisis. And he was telling me that you know, last time there was a big crisis in the United States, the inflation, um, s arguments were happening between professors um, within the schools and in the classrooms to try and discuss what was happening at the moment and what solutions that they, they can possibly come up with. And I feel like today when you look at major sheets for UCSB's 
uh, econ major or Berkeley's or anywhere else, you'll see that the majority of the courses are the fundamentals and then the next 40% is maybe accounting and finance courses. And then maybe there's a course or two that'll talk about something that's happening now. So I guess my question to you is, is basically what responsibility do you think that schools have, and I hope that there are professors or admissions people or uh, uh, administration people here, you know, hearing me ask this question, what responsibility do the students and the schools have to study this more and share it more and have more arguments in the classroom so that we're not just breeding Gordon Geckos and Jamie Dimons, you know, to take over. Yeah, Gordon Gecko is a fictional character, just to make sure everyone knows. <laughs> Jamie Dimon is very real. Uh, well, first of all, I, I can't speak to anything about UCSB, partly because they're my ride to the airport in the morning, uh, <laughs> but mostly because I have, I, I have no first-hand information and knowledge. I, I, do, I do know about MIT, I do know about other universities where this is a, a, a prominent topic, where there's a huge amount of student interest, and where I, as faculty, get on very well when I make this a central topic of, of my courses, which is, which is what I do. And I would, I would also say that my courses... Well, last fall I taught uh, two, two sets of courses, one around these issues, the kind of issues we've been talking about, but, and putting that on the, in the, in the, global, on the global stage and trying to help people understand, the, the, uh, the students in that case with mid-career executives, understand how these pieces fit together and why the global economy faces challenges along the, the same lines as I discussed with the US economy. The other course I, I, I teach is about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship in the United States and, and mostly outside the United States, where we put students to work with entrepreneurial companies that are starting up, that are attracting funding, that are trying to do things within the non-financial sphere, it must be said, uh, that, that are you know, productive and innovative and trying to transform other, other societies. And I feel very good about that combination, just personally, because I think we don't just want to sit around and criticize, we also want to go do stuff. And we want, at least at, at MIT, we want the learning to be, uh, in, in, in large part, for the students in a hands-on way, where they're trying to help people figure out how to make businesses run proper, run better, and, and, and link up what entrepreneurs are trying to do with, with great passion and great ability in many parts of the world with, with the education you get in, in, in a top management school. But that, that's just my own very, very personal perspective. I have a two-part question. Uh, part one, with the, regards to the notion that there was no alternative to the government bailout that we kept hearing, there was no alternative. Do you believe there might have been a viable uh, compromise, which not full-blown bailout, but not full-blown failure? Was there some sort of middle ground that might have been reached? And then part two is with regards to the upcoming election cycle. And I'm wondering, it doesn't sound like the economic situation is going to change much between now and Election Day 2012. And what should we as voters be on the lookout for in terms of campaign rhetoric and so forth? Uh, what are they going to be saying about the economy? What's going to be driving the, the conversation? Uh, so on, on was there a middle, a middle way or, or, or a different uh, strategy? Yes, I think there was. And that was not ideal. And it's not where you want to be, but in the fall of 2008 and early 2009, you could have fired the management of the big banks. See, Rick Wagoner, the um, CEO of General Motors, was fired as a condition of the government saving General Motors or helping General Motors uh, through its financial restructuring. There is no statute that I'm aware of or I believe that you can show me that authorizes the American government to fire the head of General Motors. That was a condition of the loan, and I can only imagine that Rahm Emanuel or someone called the chairman of the board of General Motors and made it pretty clear what was necessary. You could have let the management go, you could have fired the board of, the board of directors of Citigroup, which oversaw a huge financial calamity, could have been let go. Yeah, it's not much. Um, now, the, but the, and you could have wiped out the shareholders also could have imposed a loss on the shareholders. But the problem is, what I'm not saying to you is force a loss on the creditors. And that's the problem. You see, I don't want to say that because then I fear you could have had those cascading losses that would have caused another Great Depression. And the fact that, I'm, the fact that I can't say, let the creditors take the loss, that tells you how bad it was. I want to be in a place where I can say, just let them fail, like CIT Group. Who cares? Let them go. That's where you want to be. And, and remember, this is very important. This is not a country based on big banks. We never had big banks before. The largest six bank holding companies in this country right now have a balance sheet of 64% of GDP. 
Before the crisis, the same guys were 56% of GDP, and back in 1995, they were about 17% of GDP. We never let our banks get big for good reason. Big banks are trouble. We don't need big banks. This country was built, and prosper our prosperity was achieved without the banks being big. So you can go back to that. You can make them smaller. You can cap them. And what I would say, well, you'll hear a lot of nonsense in the 2012 uh, election cycle. Uh, I, I, don't hear you'll hear, I don't think you'll hear anyone talking about the real issues. I don't think you'll hear anyone talking about how the debt got this bad, how the banks contribute to it. And I don't think you'll hear anybody talking about any of the other core real issues. If you want to talk budget, which we haven't had time to go through all the budget issues in detail tonight, you can look at the discussion on my website. But let me tell you this, which you, which you don't want to hear. Unless you fix Medicare, this country will go bankrupt in 30 to 40 years. Now, that's not my opinion. That's not, nothing about economics. That's arithmetic. That's the CBO's projection, looking honestly at the cost of medical technology and the demographics of this country. You have to confront that issue. And I'm not sure, I don't think you're ready. I don't think the American people are ready, and I know the American politicians aren't ready to do that in 2012. But you either fix that issue, you contain those costs, or the country goes bankrupt. That's, that's it. That's the, the budget issue. All this stuff about discretionary, non-military spending, please. This, this is just window dressing. This is, sim, this is symbolic positioning for 2012. This is what they want to campaign on, perceptions. But the reality is very simple. You have to contain healthcare spending. It's not about cutting Medicare. It's about limiting future incre increases relative to the GDP. You either do that, or, or, or there's big trouble of a, of a different kind. Right now, the CFTC, FDIC is trying to write the rules for Dodd-Frank, and the only people in the public hearings are people representing the financial institutions. So I'm wondering, why do you think the advocates of financial regulation that you're talking about have failed to organize in the way that environmentalists or gun advocates or healthcare or even deficit reduction, all these groups have managed to organize effectively and, and to lobby? How come your side has not? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question and, and a fair point. That I, I've testified personally 12 or 13 times to congressional committees over the past couple of years, but you're right that I've, and I testified uh, a couple of weeks ago to the Senate Budget Committee, but you're right, I'm not testifying on, on these issues, uh, these financial regulation writing issues um, before House or Senate, and, and you're right that, that uh, none of my colleagues, to the best of my knowledge, are, are, are testifying. And it's something we, we, have to, we have to try and, and understand how we got shut out of the political process. And honestly, it's a, it's a question you should also direct to your elected representatives. I mean, it's, it's, it's fair, completely fair to ask me this question and completely uh, reasonable to press me on it. And I, sh I, I should work harder. I, I should find more hours in the day, more hours in the week to, to, to well, make more I, progress. I you're doing fine. I just think there's no law. Well, but, but seriously, it's the politicians. Where, where are your senators? Where, 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 where are your members of, uh, of the House of Representatives? At a fundraiser. <laughs> well, Ron Paul, Ron Paul is, is an interesting and, and important figure in, in, in these discussions. That was my reference to the gold standard earlier, if you didn't get it. Um, and, and Ron Paul now chairs a very powerful subcommittee. Um, of the House Financial Services, he chairs the Monetary Policy Subcommittee, which does not have direct jurisdiction on these precise issues, but certainly a, a powerful subcommittee chairman can, can weigh in. And, and I am still waiting for my invitation from Mr. Paul to testify before his subcommittee. I am available. If you want to, next time you talk to him, let him know. And, and I, on, seriously, I, I do not think that there is a lot of distance between us on these issues, on these financial regulation issues. On, on other issues, maybe there is, but on the financial regulation issues and on, on the importance of effective financial regulation and, and limiting the power of the, and the size of the biggest banks for any monetary system, that I would suggest and submit to all Mr. Paul's friends here that um, he and I should talk soon. There was a recent open hearing in Congress involved the heads of the intelligence services. And it, a number of them confirmed that the sovereignty of the United States may be compromised to an extent, especially in negotiations with China, when they keep bringing up the fact that our debt is a serious issue. Additionally, the second part of my question, sir, um, is, is that as a uh, multifaceted artist, singer, songwriter, art, uh, actor, writer, director, producer, you have to wear many hats in this recession, you see. But uh, my point is, is that 
I look back to history and I see, as you hearken back to uh, Roosevelt, um, during that time, apparently um, Ro Rockefeller uh, instituted a lobbying movement to remove the corporate charter that Pryor instituted that corporations had to have and benefit the social good. That's something that apparently no longer exists in our corporate culture. And I wanted to ask you um, your thoughts on the subject. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure that corporations ever existed uh, as a practical matter for the public good. They're, they're there to make money, let's be honest. This is capitalism, this is a market economy, and it has many benefits and, and some serious uh, drawbacks, the biggest one being that you get powerful corporations that don't care about the external effects, things that are external to their sphere of influence, to their bottom line, to their profits, to their, to their compensation. You've got to recognize that. And any leading finance person, a person not working for the banks, at least, will, will emphasize to you in, in the first conversation or the first class you have on, on, on banking that these kinds of externalities are fundamental to how banks operate and why you can't just let banks get on with doing whatever they want because they have all kinds of external effects. So the banks can go off and make money, that's fine. I don't want the government to run the banking system, but you have to recognize those external effects and, and find ways to make them relatively smaller and, and, and less damaging. And as for, as for, the, as for the Chinese, uh, you raise a very good point. You, you no doubt noticed that the uh, president of China uh, visited the United States in January to check up on his money. <laughs> and it reminded me, to, to be honest, I mean, I'm totally honest here, it reminded me of visits that the IMF used to make to Argentina in the 1990s. You know, you've lent the guys a lot of money, you know eventually they're not going to be able to pay you back, but you kind of wonder, you know, well, are they going to roll it over for another year or two? When does this thing end? And, and I guess the president of China felt that we're okay for a little bit longer. He seemed happy enough when he left. <laughs> but but we're living, we, we are living on, on, on borrowed money and borrowed time. We, we are spending more than, than we earn. Uh, we're running a big current account deficit. We cannot afford to do this for, for not just the indefinite future. We can't afford to do it as we're doing it now for, for any significant number of years. But, but again, that, that's not something that you're, our political leaders want to discuss in, in, any, in, any, in any form. We like to push these issues down the road. I think, I, I really believe in, in American democracy. I, I chose to become a, an American citizen. I actually, there's a test for that too. Who even knew there was a test? Become Ameri I did really well on that test as well. <laughs> and, and I really believe in American democracy. I believe we can come back. I think we've been here before. We've confronted concentrated power, concentrated financial power. Jefferson warned about it at the beginning of the Republic. Andrew Jackson fought against the Second Bank of the United States. Teddy Roosevelt faced down J.P. Morgan and, and really powerful people at the beginning of the 20th century. And FDR cleaned up after the Great Crash and in, in, in the Great Depression. And, and there were a lot of people who were opposed to the FD, FDR at that time, particularly from within the financial sector. We've done it before, we have to do it again. I think that we will do it. But I don't know how long the Chinese will lend us the money. And I don't know, seriously, I don't know how much time we have. Thank you very much.